You guys cracked me up. Ever since that little incendiary, little polemic that I pulled on Manhattan, that little shit-talking voice note, all the asbestos maxers are DMing me, sending me hilarious photos of them working inside their gerbil cages. It is a fucking riot. Some of this shit is so funny. It's so funny. Dude's talking about how they're fucking recycling their own fucking carbon in their high rises. One dude showed me a picture of his window trying to crank it open. He couldn't fucking open the window. Motherfuckers are just breathing in their own fucking DNA. I'm surprised some of these motherfuckers haven't reproduced with themselves. Inhaling your own fucking DNA follicle follicles. Keep those fucking pictures coming. Shit's fucking hilarious. But this is going to be a very interesting space because I'm going to do multiple breakdowns um and in true brute de force fashion i'm gonna be hopscotching between topics it's gonna be very it's gonna resemble a food fight it's gonna be very messy it's gonna be very creative it's gonna be very chaotic and and the way i wanted to open this today was i wanted to give you an illustration of one of what i consider one of the most prolific um, ingenious, industrious, and I almost, uh, I venture to call it an athletic run, even though it's not sports related, because the mental athleticism that this individual opposed, imposed on his opponents, it, it's one of the most incredible fucking glory runs I've ever witnessed in my life. You know, you can cite championship runs across many different domains. You can plunge history and you can come up with many, many impressive feats. But the one that really stands out to me is the World Series of Poker Run by Jamie Gold. And I'm telling you right now, if you consider yourself a scientist of the human mind and the human condition and you have any intrigue or fascination with the human spirit, and just the overall understanding of life 
and how all these archways and passages of time kind of coalesce in these nexus points where people throw themselves into eras and the tactics that they use to succeed are perfectly fine-tuned for the era itself like a lot of these success stories these explosive stars that just rise from nowhere it's a lot of it's luck i would say the vast majority majority of it is luck because they just happen to be in prime position they happen to be in pole position at the apex of a particular era where those tactics could be used because look here's what happens in, in life People, humans are pirates by nature, okay? Piracy has really been going on forever. And it's not just a software thing. Everybody is standing on the shoulders of giants. Everybody is jacking and repurposing and refurbishing other people's ideas. That's what humans do. That's what humans do. And piracy is a very complex topic that maybe one day we'll go into deeper because it's fascinating how humans borrow and lease you know even down to linguistic structures people lease other people's language other people's terminology other people's lexicons and then these things basically get imprinted in society so so look if you find time after this the speech you're gonna have to go to youtube and you're gonna have to look at the highlight reel of jamie gold's run in the world series of poker where it starts from day one and you watch this motherfucker steamroll. And when I say steamroll, you ain't ever seen a juggernaut on wheels like this guy. And and he and look, this guy belies the reason I the reason I like this guy, the reason I love this story, is because this guy belies all the conventional wisdom about physiognomy checks. He doesn't pass any of those tests. He doesn't pass any of the sniff tests. He's an unassuming emaciated nerd you know bespectacled he's got fucking squirrely eyes beady eyes fucking wearing little fucking spectacles totally unassuming physiognomy would tell you nothing about the guy he's a guy that in public you would consider him an invisible entity okay but this guy had zero talent for poker he wasn't a technician he wasn't a technical guy he wasn't a math guy. He wasn't a numbers guy. Okay. He waltzes into the World Series of Poker and he antics. He antics his way into the championship. I want to say he won 12 million. It might be 8 million. I haven't fact checked it in a while, but I think I'm pretty sure he took down 12 million bucks. And at the time, I want to say it was the largest. It was. It was the largest jackpot ever in a World Series of Poker championship. He won it all. Took all the marbles. Okay? On sheer antics. Antics. Not a gamer. Not a gamer whatsoever. He went completely opposite of all the theoreticians, all the game solvers. And he walked. And when I tell you he walked, he walked the boulevard into the championship basically unobstructed through mind games, enticement, inducement, getting in motherfuckers' heads, speech, freedom of speech, just absolutely crawling, crawling into the amygdala of his opponents and holding a power position there and taking the crown seat and implanting himself so firmly in his opponent's head that he would basically entice you into making horrific decisions. And that's what he did the entire game. This dude, you'll see in the clips, he's brokering miniature deals at the fucking poker table, which is like the gray area rules that this dude bent is fucking genius. It's fucking genius because what he did is he corkscrewed every gray eminence, every gray rule that was not technically written, but he, but he, he had no etiquette. You know what I mean? All etiquette was out the window. He had zero fucking etiquette. He played the game like a fucking predator and he exploited it exceptionally. Okay? Dude's literally brokering deals at the table with other players, saying, if you fold two hands from now, I'll fucking go easy on you. Shit like that. 
classic mercantilism. Mercantilism. Who the fuck introduces mercantilism into a game of poker? You know what I mean? It's completely refractory. It's completely just turn the game upside down. That's what he did. And he fucking walked his way into the championship. All off of antics, befuddling people, putting people through fucking mental torture systems. The metagame, the metagame, the game inside the game, the game inside the game. He wasn't there to play poker. He was there to play the meta. You know what I mean? Head faking you, juking you. Fucking pretending to make alliances with you and then fucking breaking the pack midway through. Just complete fucking mental psychological warfare. One of the greatest, most prolific examples you'll ever fucking witness in your life. And I do believe, correct me if I'm wrong, they actually had to revamp the championship rules after that run. Like, I believe the following year they had to clamp down and introduce an entire host of of amendments to the rules in order to shut that type of behavior down. And so that's why I tell you, this guy was hovering at the crest of an era where he was able to exploit that shit before they shut it down. So yet again, it's a classic example. And I've always said this, one of my favorite tweets, and this was a metaphor, but it's not so metaphoric. In, 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 In theory, it is, but in practice, this is a true thing. I have always told you guys, that every nerd, every nerd has their chance at the pulpit. Every nerd eventually gets called up into the big leagues. Every male on earth has the opportunity to go on their glory run. Everyone has at least one. I venture to say you have a lot more in the, in the chamber, but everyone does have at least one fucking glory run. And it just depends how well you comport yourself when you're blessed with that opportunity. Every man has it. You know what I'm saying? And, and the metaphor that I used to, to drive that point home was I said, every nerd has a chance to throw the spear at the emperor, right? That's a fact. Every nerd eventually gets to take a shot at the king, to dethrone the king. And that's what this guy did. That's what this guy did. And let me tell you something. This dude wasn't son maxing. He wasn't eating steak and eggs. Nothing of the sort. He was a pasty, skinny fat motherfucker. But just a razor sharp mental game. And he fucking pulverized the competition with head games. You know, he was playing a different game. They were there to play cards. He wasn't. He wasn't. And you can see when you watch these clips, you can actually witness the power that this guy was fucking wielding. This power was was incredible. It's palpable. It's something that you can see right off the bat. So you have to go watch Jamie Gold's run and just watch the kind of fucking fuckery that this dude was inflicting upon his opponents. Truly, truly an impressive feat. Now, the story doesn't end so well. I actually, shortly after his run, I actually played in some big games with him in Ventura, California at this little casino called Players Casino. And uh, he pretty much ended up squandering like 90% of the fortune. And then he got stuck playing like low stakes game again. And I've been out of the poker game for a while. Like I haven't played. I used to play professional poker. I don't play anymore because I just don't like sitting in a fucking dungeon for 10 hours a day. I think it's fucking uh, uh, repulsive. But from what I understood, um. He squandered all his fortune and then was stuck playing these these low games. And my understanding in the poker community is there is nothing more brutal than being able to play in these huge games and then having to go rake back and claw back and go start from the low stakes games again and build back up. That just sounds like a fucking gruesome experience. And But, you know, things have a funny way of, of ending exactly the way they begin. You know, that's like just a universal law of life that – Everything has an uncanny way of concluding itself the exact way that it started. And I think that the authorship of that story 100% confirms that that's true. High highs, low lows. And then 
I was thinking about that story, and then it, it led me to to kind of think because I've talked a lot about addiction. I've talked a lot about as a man the importance the importance to a degree of embracing whatever your affliction is like every man is, is I don't even want to call it a curse, but every man is donned some sort of affliction, whether it's an obsessive personality, there's some sort of disorder that nature bakes into men in order to create outliers. And then I started thinking about addiction and I started thinking about like, how do we grapple with these things as a society? Um, people that are mired in a concentric circle, uh, you know, of their own filth, their own sort of, their own sort of ugliness. Like, how do we grapple with this? And I've come to the inescapable conclusion that there's only two true ways out of addiction. There's two, two genuine pathways. And I don't even want to call it out. I almost want to call it in because it, both of them require to some degree leaning into it heavy and using it as sort of like an armored plating, okay? Because look, if you do have an addiction to something, I promise you that's something that you will have to fight the rest of your life. It never goes away. You can only suffocate it. You can only strangle things for too long before they start to rear their ugly head in other, in other areas. So that, that's, that's been a, a time-tested, actually failed method is people trying to pretend that the addiction doesn't exist or trying to distract themselves from it. All you're doing is plugging in the battery pack and you're going to make that motherfucker come back a hundred times stronger when it rears its head. So you basically have two choices if you have any kind of obsessive personality or affliction. Okay. And I want you to understand this because this is important. I started out by looking very hard into people who have addictions that are also very high functioning people. Okay. And the first person that comes to mind is Michael Jordan. Motherfucker has a debilitating gambling addiction. Like whatever bug gambling addiction is, he's got the fucking strongest strain. Okay. There's a lot of stories that have crept in around the crevices um, there's a lot of, you know, if you go on forums and shit, there's a lot of like fact verified stories of, of stuff that he's done around surrounding gambling. But here's, here's, here's the deal. Jordan positioned himself as such a giant. In other words, he became such a Herculean, powerful earner income, became the greatest fucking ever at his craft. Okay. And what that did is it actually rebranded the addiction as something that just has no impact? It just has no impact and it's all branding. The guy makes so much fucking money that essentially he's overpowered the addiction. If an ordinary man had the kind of bug that Jordan had, they'd be fucking flatlined instantly, squashed to dust. But Jordan... Jordan, and you can almost look, this is my personal theory, okay? My personal theory is that whatever pathology dri drives that man to gamble as hard as he does, his, his basketball prowess and his basketball proficiency, I believe, was actually the, the defense mechanism to cover that up. 100%. So what I'm saying is, even though that impulse may have been germinating, and it may have been very tiny inside him at one point, I do believe his talent and everything that kind of spurned forth from that was an ab reaction. It was a reaction to essentially eclipse that fucking force. And so now you got a billionaire who can fucking do whatever the fuck he pleases. He can engage in de degeneracy. He can fucking gamble everything he fucking wants. His income has basically overpowered it in such a way. So that's one option. You either become such an income earning fucking prolific machine, a cash powered machine to where you can basically survive whatever the fuck output you got. That's one pathway. And the other pathway is you consume 
whatever it is that's plaguing you so much, so often in such high doses that you basically just consume its spirit. You basically just engulf the spirit, the very essence of the thing that you're consuming to the point where it just becomes part of the mosaic, just becomes kind of part of like the tapestry of your life. And now when you walk, it's just been integrated. It's been integrated. It's not something that you fight. It's not something that you resist. It's something that has sort of crystallized itself and kind of baked itself into the organism through intense heat and temperature and pressure. And then you, everything you do is sort of like a funnel to that thing that you're obsessed with. You know what I mean? Like, like, look, this plays out on a daily fucking basis. You have people who love to fucking trade. You got fucking gamblers. You got fucking crypto guys. You got guys on wall street making, taking huge shots. But a lot of these guys have set up these little functional mechanisms like these other little income streams to essentially feed the obsession. So that's what they've done. They've casted a very wide net and whatever they catch, whatever, you know, when they eat what they kill, they funnel the obsession. So basically everything in their life becomes a tunnel to the next lick. And that's how, that's how a lot of very high powered people operate, but where you get clapped where you get clapped really, really hard is when you get caught in between one of those two modes that I just outlined for you. And you get someone who's addicted, but they're consuming aimlessly and they're consuming mindlessly and they're kind of trapped in that middle. Those guys die real quick. They die real quick. They get clapped. They end up giving up the ghosts too early in life. And that's just kind of... There, there really is no way out. There really is no way out. And I think that that's, that's a peace offering. That's not something that should, I, I think that's something that should feel alleviating to a lot of people. Knowing that you have to kind of embrace um, whatever kind of personal, personality traits that, that you've been blessed with. Like that's just kind of the direction that everything's headed. Um, and then... I, like, I can't even believe this has to be addressed, but I was, I was looking at, I, I cannot believe that there's still full grown men who watch videos on Instagram or videos on Facebook and shit. Like, do you guys not understand that every fucking video that you see outside of like personal videos is completely choreographed, scripted and fake? Like it's, it's everything is fake. When I see a video, like there was a video a couple of weeks ago, people were DMing this to me because they wanted my take on it. I don't know if you guys saw this, but essentially there was surveillance footage of a bar and some dude comes in hard charging with a rifle and there were patrons in there and all the patrons basically take a dive to the bottom of the bar and they're on their hands and knees. And this guy comes charging in with the rifle and he points it at the cashier. And you can clearly tell that it's a stick up, right? It's, a, it's an armed robbery. But there's some fucking portly, surly, little sordid character right in the center of the footage. This dude was like a fat dude with glasses. And he's, drink, he's drinking soup or some shit. He's like ladling his mouth with soup very calmly. He's got a newspaper. He's just like browsing the newspaper and there's a rifle two inches from his head. And the guy, well, he follows my number one rule of life, which is don't flinch. But the guy is sitting there completely unfazed and everybody is, is there's like a little skirmish that's breaking out on the floor. People are putting their hands up. He's collecting wallets, shit like that. And this dude is sitting at the bar and you can see the guy with the rifle is taking little jabs at him with it. Like, he doesn't actually make physical contact, but he fakes him like, I'm going to fucking jab you with the rifle if you don't fucking cooperate. And the dude casually turns his head, stares at the rifle, then goes back to his soup. He's just sitting there like nothing's wrong. And everyone made a huge fuss about this video. And everyone was like, what the fuck is this? How is this guy so fucking poised? How is he so sang Freud? 
And I'm sitting there and I'm like, dude, you guys all got fucking fooled. That video is fake. Like that video was a fucking skit. And everything is a fucking skit is what I'm trying to tell you. Like you guys genuinely cannot comprehend how fucking like Instagram is unscrollable. Because every fucking video on there is 100% altered and 100% fake. All of it. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. Reality TV. Reality TV is actually what's programming all the women in society right now. That's 100% true. Um, Because reality, look, reality TV is so brilliant. It's so genius the way they did it with the way these tastemakers uh, injected themselves into the culture. It's so fucking brilliant what they did. They've programmed all these young girls who watch the Kardashians and all these fucking reality TV shows, Housewives of Miami. You guys realize every squabble in those shows is 100% scripted and fake, right? Like, there's none of it's real whatsoever. They're actors. They're fucking F-list actors. It's all fake. And what they've done is the cultural engineering is so brilliant because basically, if you look at all of these TV shows, the theme is the same. It's just women disparaging men, condescending men, patronizing men, and cursing like sailors and fucking philandering and just doing all sorts of off the wall masculine behavior. And and this is this is the modeling agency. This is where a lot of the youth and these up and coming Gen Z girls, this is where they're getting their inspiration from. They're watching these women conduct themselves in this manner and they're framing it and they're using it as the model and example of a relationship. And this is where it's all coming from. It's all coming from the Hollywood production system and it's all fucking fake. Like head to toe. I promise you the weddings, the fucking, the, the drama, none of it's real. It's all manufactured. It's all choreographed. It's all stylized. It's fucking yellow journalism. It's muckraking. It's fucking muckraking. That's what it is in its fundamental form. So, like, I have an embargo on this shit in my household. Like, you, no one that I associate with is even allowed to watch this trash in front of me. Because I don't even, I don't even want to walk around the house during the day if I'm working. I don't even want to hear this shit in the background. I find it that to be that fucking repulsive. It's fucking disgusting. Instagram is e- equally fucking appalling. Like, some of the shit that people fucking believe on these videos that they see, it's just incredible. It's incredible to, incredible to me how dumb the average person truly has become. No discernment whatsoever. It's just zero discernment, zero critical thinking to, to fucking figure out what's fake, what's real, what's true, what's not. Why is this video been perfectly constructed? What message are they trying to send me? Why was this video crafted this way? Why was it edited so fucking perfectly? Nobody seems to take this shit into account because I think people just want to be vegetables. I really do. I think people want to just be in a half-baked larval-like state lobotomized because I think it takes away the pain. I think it's like the syringe. You know what I mean? It's, it, it really is kind of a sedative. And, and and look, this goes back to my original point about how if you do want to make behavior modification at all, okay, you, you have to rebrand the thing that you want to change. That's the only way true change will ever work is it's you have to kind of you have to be a creative. You have to launch your own rebranding campaign. If I go on Twitter right now and I tell you cigarettes are a homosexual drug. Cigarettes are a sedative. They're not a stimulant. Cigarettes will turn you into a gigantic pussy. Okay? If I say that, then someone fucking piggybacks it. Then another guy piggybacks it. Soon you got 10, 20 of us telling it to you. How many motherfuckers by the end of the week on Twitter do you think are throwing away their cigarettes? I bet you all my fucking weight in gold, tons of motherfuckers are throwing them in the fucking trash. Because that's how powerful a rebranding campaign is. All that is is rebranding. It's taking the exact same element, flipping it on its head, saying a whole different host of of attachments and attributes and assigning those attributes to it. And now everything's fucking rebranded. Now cigarettes are a fucking gay drug. Done. That's how fucking easy it is. This is all snap of the finger fucking witchcraft. 
That's how easy it is. So if you do want to make a change and you want behavior modification, you have to personally go into the belly of the beast and you have to rebrand the tools and the mechanisms that don't work for you. That's the only way to fucking do it. It's a rebranding campaign. And you have to bombard it until it sticks. Very difficult to do on your own. Very easy to do if you're at the behest of a group of people doing it. Then it becomes very easy to do. Uh, fuck. So, look, let me give you, I told you this shit was just going to be fucking flighty. We're fucking, we're fucking loop jumping right now. I will tell you something. One of the best indicators, by far, bar none, hands down, that a woman loves and respects the fuck out of you. You can conduct an experiment. This is a DIY home experiment that you can conduct. And I promise you, this has an 100% effective rate of producing the result that you want it, that you want to see. It's 100% accurate, okay? What you do is you wait till late at night while your girl's with you at your crib and you order food to the house for yourself. She's, she's not hungry. You order it for yourself. When that food gets delivered, you go sit at the fucking dining room table and you fucking open it. I am telling you for a fucking fact. You want nuance. If your girl goes and sits at the table with you while you're eating that meal, just because she wants to keep you company and be around you while you're eating, that 100% of the time is her communicating her undying loyalty to you. That is the, because women can't tell you what they really feel, right? They're never going to, the woman telling you she's loyal means nothing. You want to talk about the greatest indicator on earth? There it is right there. If she's willing to sit with you while you're eating, she doesn't even want to bite, just wants to be around your presence. It's that fucking potent. It means you have an undyingly loyal woman by your side. 100% of the time. And if you fucking rip open that meal and she she doesn't sit there on her own, I promise you there are some underlying issues. This one is fucking bulletproof that I just told you. It's bulletproof. It's fucking trans-denominational. It doesn't matter what your race or fucking creed is. This is a universal thing because when a man is in repast and eating a meal, that is the time for harmony and unity within the family. And that's when it comes out because that natural female instinct to surround herself around that kind of energy and that kind of vibration is always going to get unleashed when that's happening. So that's a phenomenal one. And you can fucking cherry pick shit like this all day. You know, there's there's so many indicators. I was going to do a post on this because there are some serious nuanced ones where a woman truly shows you where she stands with you by some of these very, very, very microscopic behaviors. They are so fucking insightful. They're so insightful. What I was going to do is, by the way, what's up with the fucking messaging in this culture? right now makes me very leery people are doing this kind of like anti-anger messaging like every fucking coffee shop you walk into it, it feels like the modern culture is really just trying to curb your intensity they just really want to fucking curb your intensity at every fucking glance like everything is live love laugh namast in coffee shops you got fucking cute slogans telling you to fucking relax Every fucking imprint on, like, T-shirts and shit. Everything's about fucking recovery, relax, recuperate. It's, it's almost like they just want to gut. They want to gut that fucking instinct of intensity out of people. And it, it's very effective. It's a very effective campaign. I'm privy to it. It doesn't work on me. But I'll tell you something. Um, the, the, the response to that. The response to that shit is the, the this culture, this culture above anything else, really, really, really wants to just create vanilla characters. Okay, that that is the ding on siege. Like that is the essence of what is going on. They want vanilla characters, generic, 
They want everybody to be very fucking generic. And that's really just what it comes down to. That's why, even in the mental health thing, people really fucking lambast any type of creativity or any kind of ingenuity or innovation in general. It just gets fucking annihilated. Because when you are front running or trailblazing any kind of curiosity that's leading you into a direction that maybe nobody else has written before, maybe nobody else has expounded on this before in literature or history, and you're kind of trailblazing a path, it's frowned upon. It's frowned upon, and there's going to be a lot of misunderstanding. People will misunderstand the fuck out of you because a lot of times when you are spearheading some kind of movement, you're going to make a lot of mistakes that are not readily apprehensible to the person who's following the movement. So mistakes will be made. Things get misconstrued. There's a lot of misconceptions that happen along the way. And then your job as a leader of taking responsibility for spearheading that movement is to correct that. Now, that might take a long time to correct, but it is ultimately the responsibility of the leader to correct that perception because a lot of decisions that are made by legionnaires and sentinels and infantrymen, people that are in the shadows of the leader, you know what I mean, that are acting in lockstep with whatever the agenda is, those people don't necessarily understand sometimes a decision that the person at the helm is making. But the clarity comes later on as things sort of materialize and as things happen. That's a very, very, very common pattern. And I think that halts a lot of potential leaders in their tracks because people, a lot of leaders also want the gratification and the encouragement and the morale of the people that they're working with. And sometimes it's very easy to have them deflated and you lose that morale and people get demoralized because they don't understand the decisions that the leader's making at the time because it doesn't, it's, not, it's not supposed to make sense in that moment. That's why the, a new movement is being birthed. That's why it's being spawned. That's why it's called trailblazing because nobody's been there before. So, of course, the details are going to be very murky and opaque. And, of course, sometimes it's, there's going to be cataracts. You know what I mean? There's going to be cataracts. It's going to be very, very difficult to see what's happening at times, especially when you're at the tip of the spear. That's a fucking massive one. But anyway, my whole point of the original story about how everything in, you know, coffee shops and just the culture, modern culture in general is telling you about decompressing is because I want you to understand that anger, anger is the prerogative of aristocrats. Okay? Anger is the prerogative of aristocrats. It's, it's reserved for the sovereign. Only sovereign men can afford to be angry. And anybody who tries to tell you not to be angry, I promise you, refuses to relinquish their own anger. They just don't want you to be angry at them. They just don't want you to be angry at them. Look, if you want a template because I believe this is the true model for emotional well-being. I want you to think and go look back at the story of Alexander when he's screaming at his enemies atop the roof of Gaza. Like that story when he was screaming at the enemies atop Gaza, that to me is the template and the model for correct emotional well-being. Go take a deep dive into that one. It is, it is 100% a prerogative of the aristocrats. Because look, God, historically, in every scripture, sends his mortals into fury. Only his finest mortals, by the way. Only his most, only the ones that he gives laudation and blandishments to. Those mortals are granted the blessing of anger to accomplish God's mission. The Iliad makes this very clear, by the way, that the savage, passionate emotions are the ones that authenticate and validate a man's existence as truth. So I think that you don't want to quell your anger. Anger, by the way, and I will, I will, tell, I will say this 100% is the hill I'll die on, 
is the cleanest green source of energy on the planet. Anger is the cleanest green source energy on the planet. More structure, infrastructure, systems, cultures, dynamics, power dynamics have been erected from man harnessing their anger and applying it forward than any other emotion in totality. Combine every fucking emotion you want together. Nothing is more fucking righteous than the indignation of a man who's fucking angry and uses it correctly. So be very, very leery of any motherfucker who tells you not to be angry because I promise you the most dangerous people on earth are the hippies and the new age philosophers who try to brush everything off and tell you don't ever get upset, don't ever get mad. Be like water, right? The Tao Te Ching. Be like water. Flow with everything they tell you. That's what they tell you. But they're wrong because all of those guys, all those hippies that, that fucking pray with animals and shit, I am telling you right now for a fact, they have more anger brooding under the surface than a fuck than fucking Mount Vesuvius. Those motherfuckers are one snap away from completely fucking losing it because they don't have a pressure release valve. So anybody who tells you not to be angry has a fuckload of anger beneath the surface. You can believe that. You can fucking believe that. That's why I've never jived with any of these motherfuckers, men who claim positive vibes only. What the fuck is that? So you're just tell you're going to disobey that you're going to disregard the fact that there's a whole other half of the human animal that exists. And you're going to tell me that you're a nature boy on top of it. You're primal. You're primal, but you're afraid to confront the savage passionate instincts inside the animal. Makes zero fucking sense. Zero fucking sense. I was thinking about the Gregorian calendar. I was thinking about the Gregorian calendar and how the common denominator of the, of a loser, people who stay poor the rest of their life, is is one true thing, and it's 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 really fucking genius the way they've just man these all these man made constructions are so fucking enslaving in in, in in myriad ways. But basically, what I want you to fundamentally understand is. The whole idea of paying rent on the first, bills due every 30 days, that is a trap. That is a, is a, that's, that's meant to ensnare you, okay? It's meant to ensnare you, and it's meant to get your fucking bear paws stuck in the fucking trap. And I'll tell you why. That's not how nature works whatsoever. That's not how nature works. And what happens is, especially in a modern landscape like this, when rent is due on the first, when bills are due every 30 days, everybody wants to hack the system. So everybody just coasts. You're just going to coast because bills are due three weeks from now. Why the fuck would I work harder? Why would I get creative? Why would I try to innovate? Why would I try to get a side income? It's due in 30 days. Not a big deal. It's going to catch up. You're going to get a paycheck. You're going to make it. But that's not what anyone remotely successful subscribes to at all. In fact, it's literally the opposite. You know, when I was in my 20s, and I, I, I told this story before, I did an interview with Frazzle Dazzled on Twitter. He's a good dude. And one of my first interviews was with him, and I told this story. And this story somewhat put me on the map on Twitter. And I said, look, when I was in my mid-20s, mid I was so bored with the system. The system is so gay. It, it's not offering people anything. It's just offering you work enslavement. That's all it's offering. And so when I was in my mid-20s, I was so existentially bored and tormented thinking about having to work a job that I couldn't stand that I had to put the pressure on myself. I had to play mind games with myself in order to be entertained. Now, a lot of very, very, very successful people play mind games with themselves. Because culture is so gay, you do have to, like I've always said, you do have to create your own gauntlets. You have to create your own rites of passage. You have to implement difficulty settings. Like you have to spearhead this stuff because society is not going to give it to you anymore. Society is designed to make your life easier. And I 
there's so much nuance to this. I don't ever want you to conflate the word easy with better. Easy does not necessarily mean better. Just because something makes your life easier does not mean for one fucking second that it's made your life better. Naval is the master of this. Naval has a bunch of different tweets and philosophies and little one-liners. Yeah, they're hard cutting. They definitely punch hard. But a lot of his stuff is about making your life easier. And I don't equate easier to, to mean better at all, especially not as a man. So what I did in my mid-20s is, and I told this story, is I I decided, wait a minute, if I go check into a fucking luxury hotel, then rent due every day, right? It doesn't matter if I'm broke. That's irrelevant. It doesn't matter what my financial status is. It doesn't matter what my station in life is. If I live in a hotel, rent is due every day. If I don't show up tomorrow and present cash to the front desk by, by 3 p.m., I'm kicked out on the fucking street. But a loser doesn't think like this. So I... Gathered up three days of a hotel room. I gave myself a three-day head start. I said, I'm going to check myself in this fucking hotel room, and I am not leaving this hotel room until I have amassed a worthy amount of bread. I don't give a fuck what it takes because I have to perform every day now. I have to eat what I kill. I have to make a sale. I have to make a sale. I was doing drones. I was doing watches at the time, luxury watches. I have to sell today because if I don't sell, I'm kicked out. I'm homeless. And I'm not taking the easy way out. I'm not going to my fucking seedy little apartment where rent's due every 30 days. It's too easy. It's too easy. Men don't do jack shit when things are fucking easy. They don't. Everybody's a biohacker. You know, biohacking is such a gay fucking word because it's innate to the human organism. Everyone's a fucking biohacker. Everyone's looking for fucking shortcuts for equilibrium. Everybody's naturally going to fucking do that. So if you give a man a fucking inch, he'll take a mile. 30 days is fucking bullshit. That's way too much time. That's why nobody accomplishes anything. So I fucking said to myself, look, I'm in my mid-20s. I'm sharp. I'm fucking brusque. I got all this fucking energy. I need to fucking ramp this up. I need to throw a lot more pressure on my shoulders so I can fucking grow from this and turn myself into a fucking behemoth. And that's what I did. I checked myself into the hotel room and I cannot tell you, knowing for a fact the next day I had to get money deposited at the front desk turned me into a fucking monster. I had to make sales. I didn't have a choice. I needed it more than you on the phone. You were on the other end of the phone telling me no, but I needed you to say yes more than you needed to say no. Who do you think wins that equation? Who wins the equation in sales when you want to say no, but I need you to say yes more than you have to say no? Who wins? Tug of war, right? Tug of war. Who wins that fucking war? I do. I do. Every time. So I would get up in the morning and I would be frenetic. I would be completely out of my mind frenetic. I have to make a sale today. I got to recruit other motherfuckers. I got to keep my guys sharp. I got to fucking hire a motherfucker. I got to stay on top of his ass. I got to whip these horses. I got to get these horses in the stable. Now I got to race these horses. All sorts of fucking crazy shit. And you speed up the fucking time frame. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, and look, this is not going to work for 90% of the world. Okay. A lot of you are going to live vicariously through this story. But it's not ninety percent fall flat and are probably booted by the end of the week. But for the truly dedicated and committed, and frankly sick and twisted, because like I've always told you, you do have to be a bit of a sicko in order to make it in this life. These mind games that you can play with yourself can one hundred percent bend reality in time. Now I'm warping time. There's no thirty days means nothing to me anymore. It's a, it's on a day to day basis. And what happens is because I was living on a day to day basis. I was also free. There was an emancipation and a liberation in that style of living because I knew I could lay it all on the line every day. You know what I mean? I'm waking up. I'm feeling the entire pantheon of emotions. I'm living the emotions that would ordinarily take an entire life cycle to feel. I'm going through all of them, the full gradient, the full spectrum on a daily fucking basis. I'm going from despair to sadness to melancholy to felicity to fucking absolute fucking joy, to to, to being petrified. I'm going through the entire pantheon of emotions on a daily basis. There's nothing to hold back anymore. I'm responsible for myself. No one's bailing me out. I got to make a fucking sale. I'm a young guy. I can fucking accomplish this. Long story short, I ended up living there for six months without leaving. And by the end of the six months, I amassed a fortune where it was too easy. Now it was too easy to live in the hotel. Now it was too, the five star, I hacked that game. It was too easy. I beat the game. 
I beat the game. Just like a fucking solver. Just like how every game eventually gets beat, right? Poker's dead. The margins have been squeezed in poker. Poker's done. The solvers, the math guys figured it out. That game's been hacked. They now know all the fucking correct moves. There, there literally is a textbook correct move for every fucking situation that can arise in poker now. So the margins are squeezed. There's no money in it. Yeah, a few of the top guys are still killing here and there, of course. But the, the common guy can't walk into a poker table anymore and play like it's the fucking gold rush. That frontier is done. Dunzo. Banished. Because the game, every game gets solved. Chess eventually be like that. AI is eventually going to solve chess. It's going to be boring. No one's going to give a fuck about chess anymore. Games are meant to be broken. The, games are meant to collapse upon themselves. And that's why I'm telling you, you have to be the author of your own game. I created my own game. I beat it. It was too fucking easy after a while. Then I had to move on to a greater challenge because I had too much money. I was sitting in the hotel. I could have I prepaid a year after a while. I'm selling watches. I got a big fucking sales team. These guys are selling. We're all selling. We're all hustling, bustling, stacking money. I beat the fucking game. Then you have to impose and you have to levy a new game upon yourself in order to get that challenge and get the experience because life's not going to give it to you. Life's not going to give it to you. Life will give you a fucking, what do you call that gay thing? A fucking soul cycle or fucking Peloton? Like, that's the type of shit society's offering you. You can fucking bike ride stationary in your fucking living room. Like, that's a, that's a lame game. The society's not going to offer you these fucking, these, the, these structures. You have to levy them on yourself. If you truly want to get to the next level, I'm telling you, men do not change unless they have to. It's never going to happen. Until the floor is dropped out from underneath you and you genuinely have to perform and fight for yourself and stand up on your own two feet as a man, you're not going to fucking change a fucking thing. Because you have to understand we're wired for homeostasis. The organism biologically is wired to do as little as possible. But then you don't, you don't create a giant. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't get a Saddam Hussein. You don't get a fucking Donald Trump. You don't get a fucking – you don't get any of these figures. Unless you disobey homeostasis and try to stay there for as long as you can. That's the key. Look, I'll tell you something. Stress, I'll tell you one of the biggest lies that I've ever fucking heard in society is that stress kills. They say stress kills. That's a total, fuck, that's a total fucking fabrication. I have never seen in my entire fucking life, you, I've never seen one example of a man who was in charge of his own stress, meaning he imposed it upon himself that aged anything short of beautifully. I mean, the most stressed out guys that have tyrannical pressure on their shoulders every day always fucking look amazing. They fucking look incredible. Their skin's always glistening. They always got a dense head of hair. They're fucking always fucking filled to the brim with fucking energy and salubrity and then you and then you you kind of reverse it and you're like wait a minute look at the reality of the situation look at all the lazy fat fucks that don't do anything and have no stress they age horribly they age like fucking spoiled milk they look fucking terrible they look like rat fetuses they look fucking awful there's no doubt in my mind that stress is the fountain of youth for men it, it, it has to be. But here's the nuance. Here's the nuance. As long as the stress is not imposed by somebody else, meaning you are not a slave to somebody else's structures. I do think that stress is chronic as opposed to the acute stress of running it yourself. If you are a man who does love the heroic mission and you do want to levy the stress upon yourself meaning you're at liberty you are freely choosing to put yourself through the stress you age like a fucking boss many such examples many such even people who don't even have a good diet like tate doesn't even have a good diet but tate's my age me and him were born in the same year dude's fucking aged wonderfully looks healthy but he's lived an extremely fucking stressful life. He's had a lot of fun. I've lived an extremely, extremely stressful life. I've been under chronic stress for like 17 years to the point where I don't even know how to relax. I don't want to relax. I have zero desire for peace and relaxation in my life. Zero. 
I don't give a fuck. I've been under chronic, chronic, chronic fucking stress. But I've aged extremely fucking well. Like my vitals, my fucking vital signs and shit, my aura, it's all correct. It's all correct because I'm living in harmony with my true nature. And that's what I want to tell you. So it's it's funny. People are like, well, well, Brute, what about your aorta? Don't you think your aorta is going to give out? Fucking aorta is going to give out. The fuck are you talking about? If that was the case, I would have been dead fucking 10 years ago. Instead, my vitals are just getting better. They're just fucking getting better. Yeah, my fucking temples are grizzled. I got fucking gray hair. I've been graying since I was 19. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. What kind of man are you trying to fucking dye your hair? <laughs> I said this on the last spaces. Like that whole rugged individuality that you guys picked up from Michael Mason Porfirio. You got you're the, the guy you guys are the same motherfuckers who are fucking spray tanning and fucking getting veneers and fucking trying to cover use facial toners and cover up all your blemishes and shit. Come on, brothers. You're a fucking man. Your your hardware is meant to be driven really rough. You know what I mean? It's meant to go off roading. You ain't driving a fucking Maybach. You ain't driving a couch on wheels. You're a fucking man. You're meant to get fucking some battle scars, some fu- some fucking wrinkles, some crow's feet, fucking jettisoning out out of your eyes. That's that's meant. That's baked into the equation. And I and I do think that archetype is going to come roaring back. By the way, heavy. These these idiots who are fucking these older men who are obsessed with trying to look twenty years younger. They're totally paving the way for the youth to come rushing back in with that with that old fucking rugged look like fucking tom Selleck from like magnum pi like none of those motherfuckers even lifted weights like all those old male sex symbols and shit that women used to fucking fawn over those dudes like literally didn't even touch a weight and shit they were just like lean they maybe were a little bit barrel chested but and they were rugged as fuck they're all fucking wrinkled and shit go look at fucking clint eastwood go look at fucking john wayne like that's the classic that's the classic fucking like masculine archetype. And we've strayed very far from that shit, which is gay as fuck, by the way. Super fucking gay. It's, it's, it, it, it all goes back to the confidence of just rocking what you got. You, you can't beat that shit, fellas. You can't beat that shit. You just, you cannot. You know, I, I had a horrible, I was telling you guys last year, I had a horrible hives outbreak. I had an allergic reaction to raw dairy and I had a horrific case of hives. I looked like a leper. I had fucking hives from head to toe. Head to toe. The most brutal, atrocious looking welts you've ever seen. I looked like a fucking alien from head to toe. Okay. I was still going to fucking public pools at hotels and shit. I didn't give a fuck. Taking my shirt off. Fucking walking around. Rocking it. Rocking it. It's a fucking accessory. An accessory. I I would never, ever, ever try to hide an ailment or fucking like have that debase my character or fucking minimize me or or micro miniaturize me in any way, shape, or form. I rocked it. I rocked it. And I was with my chick at the time. I was fucking her every day with literal head to toe hives. I didn't give a fuck. And in turn, she didn't give a fuck. And in turn, the public doesn't give a fuck. See how that works? See how that works? Everything's fucking confidence. Everything's about rocking with what you got. Everything is. I also don't think it's possible, by the way, to transform into a great figure unless you have beaten back some kind of severe illness or ailment. And when it comes to health, when it comes to health in particular, I only trust, you know how in the money game, you don't trust broke people. You only trust people who've made bread, right? You take money advice from people who've made money. The health game is the opposite. I only trust motherfuckers who have been deathly sick and ill and cured it and cured it and came roaring back and beat that shit back and overcame it and put it in remission and fucking squashed it. Like that's the motherfucker I want the health advice from. Not these fucking G.I. Joe males stuck in the plastic box who just eat fucking steak and eggs all day and, and fucking tan their nuts and tell you that everything's fucking peachy. I don't trust that shit whatsoever. You know why? Because the reality of the situation is this. If truly eating steak and going for a 10-minute in the walk in the sun, like if eating steak and eggs and getting sunshine is actually solving your problems, 
You never had any real problems, my friend. You were kidding yourself. You were kidding yourself. How the fuck does eating steak and eggs and getting 10 minutes of sunshine a day and tanning your nuts actually solve real problems like in business and shit? How, how does that work? Like, what the fuck are these guys talking about? It's fucking insane. That's level one thinking. Yeah, I understand it might reorder, reorient your fucking mind frame a little bit. But if, if, if that, if like literally tiptoeing through the fucking daisies and doing affirmations and doing these little rituals and shit and eating steak is solving your problems, then all your problems were in your head. You don't, you, you don't know what real problems are, my friend. You don't know what real problems are, my friend, because, you know, a lot of problems that are plaguing society are being tackled through Sprite, Diet Coke, and Mountain Dew. There's motherfuckers that are jackhammering problems down to the fucking core that are drinking Mountain Dew right now. Their diet's way more fucked up than yours, but they've also extinguished a hundred forest fires before noon, and you're still figuring out how to start your first forest fire. You know what I mean? So the level one thinking on Twitter, I do have a strong suspicion that's going to die very soon. All these health accounts dedicated... By the way, there's just something very feminine about being a dedicated health account. Like, as a man, I'm just, I don't know. I don't jive with the healer shit at all, like whatsoever. I think healing is a woman's job for sure. They're the best at it. So I just think, that, like, if you're a dedicated, like, health and wellness account, it's a little fucking off-putting and disconcerting as a man. There's just something going on there. Some sort of like stunted growth. It's obviously a part of the equation, but I mean, go back and look at all the fucking guys that you, that, that have their legacy cemented and immortalized. You know, all of them, all, every single one of them has the common denominator. They beat an illness, some illness that they thought what they was going to kill them, whether it was dysentery, dyspepsia, black plague, whatever the fuck it was. Every man has been brought into their knees with a serious illness and then overcoming that illness is where they drew a lot of their inspiration from. Now, obviously, because there's, you know, some IQ differential in this in the space, I'm not telling you, obviously, to go seek out a, a fucking intentional illness. But what I am telling you is that if you are living at the brink of your capacity, oftentimes, oftentimes, part of the rite of passages is you will get sick in some way. Some sort of illness will overtake you if you're living at the edge of your capacity. It just happens. It just happens. You know, inflammation is a motherfucker because I'm a very experimental guy. I'm very Frankensteinian in that way. I am so fucking experimental. I love experimentation, especially hardcore shit. So I told you I had been on a kick of drinking organic, natural biodynamic wine for like three and a half, four months, right? That fucking substance as good as it is in the sense that it, you don't have the afterglow. You don't have the after effects of the fucking haze. You don't wake up in the hazy malaise. doesn't happen. You don't, you don't get hung over on the organic natural wine shit. You just don't. I've, I've tried. I fucking drink four bottles in one day, wake up the next morning ready to fucking rock. Conventional wine, that doesn't happen. But what happened to me is that I was training really fucking hard on the Olympic lifts while I was like semi drunk. Cause I just wanted to fucking see what my, what my capability was. And I'm not kidding in the last three months, this has never happened to me in my life until I started drinking alcohol. Um, I tore my forearm cleaning 310 pounds, literally tore my fucking forearm, heard it snap. The tendon rolled up into my elbow, missed the lift, had to drop it. Came back the next day trying to do contralateral work on the other arm, tore my left lat, rolled my ankle running sprints a week later. And then when I fucking tore my forearm, the way the bar dropped, I had to go to a fucking physio to get an x-ray. I actually fucking had a hairline fracture on my wrist. So I had a hairline fracture on my wrist, torn forearm, torn lat, rolled ankle all within like three weeks of drinking heavy because inflammation I'm telling you all injuries are, are sourced in inflammation systemic. There's, there's abs. I'm hundred percent positive that every, every biological organism is the same to that degree. I want to say every fucking intensely sustained injury besides like a freak accident or some incredible, like, like collision is 100% the body detaching itself because of inflammation.
because that's never fucking happened in my entire life. Now, here's the other thing. We talk about mental athleticism and mental agility. I refused to take any of the doctor's advice. I don't rest. When I'm hurt, I refuse to rest. I believe movement is medicine. I've always proven this to myself. I have a Wolverine-like rapid recharge capability just, I think, because of my mindset. I'm able to get back in the gym when I'm hurt. I work around it. I think a huge part of being a man is learning how to work around injuries, physical and emotional. You have to still show up. There's always things you can do. Now, an injury is said to be healed when the injured side is stronger than the contralateral side. Many life lessons in there. That is a fucking metaphor for life. An injury is said to be healed when the injured side is stronger than the contralateral side. Now think about a broken heart. Think about a broken mind. Think about think about it from a more pataphysical perspective. It's the fucking truth, right? So moving through it, getting back in the gym, training legs, doing farmer's carries with the other side actually helped the contralateral side heal faster or the side that was injured. And that's been, that's been true to my experience from day fucking one. By the way, I'll give you a little sneak peek because I, I am um, I am actually releasing the 12, my, my personal 12 rules to life, which, by the way, are very well thought out. I actually, look, I don't, I don't plan anything in my life, okay? You guys know that I subscribe to the philosophy, whoever has the most fun wins. I don't believe in planning. I don't believe in allotting time to do anything. I fucking beat to my own drum. If I want to pop out a thread, I'll sit down and pop a thread. But the bottom line is when I wrote these 12 rules, I knew it was going to be off the cuff. And I knew the inspiration was just going to come to me like a bolt from the blue. It was going to come down to me from the fucking heavens. I didn't need to sit there and rack my brain. I don't believe in overthinking. I'm going to sit down, flip open my phone, and I'm just going to write the fucking rules because they're already in me somewhere. I just got to spill them out. So that's exactly how that was conducted, okay? The mentorship that I just did is fucking killer. Absolutely killer. Do you guys, so do you guys understand that all the physiognomy changes that you guys want so bad, you guys talk about aesthetics and and being handsome and all that type of shit. I don't think a lot of people have really figured out yet that you actually build the correct look by pushing your shoulder to the wheel. That's something that you're obsessed with, something that you're extremely passionate about. You give a motherfucker a three-year business trench to dig from scratch, and you, you the guy pushes his shoulder to the wheel at this every fucking day with all his might. That guy is going to resemble a World War II veteran with a thousand-yard stare. You think I'm fucking kidding. I've always said business is the closest cousin to war. You can resist that thought all you want. You're wrong. It's true. Business is the closest cousin to war, especially in a capitalist society because of the competition and what it does to the hormonal profile when you are actually tackling genuine fucking problems on a daily basis. It will change the appearance of a man drastically. Throw, throw him into the wolves, watch himself dig himself out. That motherfucker's coming back a different being. And that's what the, the mentorship that I was offering the other day is fascinating because it's an accountability thing. It's the only way a man can change his life is by changing the way he looks at things, by the way. I've always said this. You cannot change your character and you cannot change your DNA. The only thing you can change as a man is the way you look at things. And when you change the way you look at things, everything fucking changes. So perspective does matter. You look at things from a different lens. You've changed your life. You've changed your fucking life. Um, so what I'm doing right now is I'm getting ready. I got the fucking docu series prepared. I got the fucking book ready to launch. I'm also about to do the in person. I'm doing an in person three day. Don't want to call it a fucking retreat because that's not what it is. But it's a deeply, deeply intense immersion experience where I am gonna have your attention for about seventy two straight hours. And it's going to be very exclusive. It's going to be very expensive. It's probably going to be like 25 or 30K ahead. But basically, you are going to sit with me 
And I am going to basically put on the greatest sales clinic of all time. That's what I'm going to do. I'm You are going to fucking twist my brain and I am going to break down the exact fucking psychology behind sales, behind raising capital, behind all the shit that you guys know I'm fucking exceptional at. I'm going to show you how to speak. I'm going to show you tone. I'm going to teach you fucking everything that I fucking know about sales. Because that truly actually always has been my forte. And I've never read a fucking book. It's just an eight. But I've been able to go to the distillery and break these concepts down. You know, the guys that have gone on these heroic missions with me, the guys that have gambled, you know, a lot of these guys within a five-month period, they're fucking voice octave completely fucking changed like I, I could tell the hormonal uptick in the regularity of their hormones completely fucking increased like i was talking to a boy when we first started and then at the end of the five months because we went through it together i'm talking to a fucking man with hair on his chest the way they talk the way they're assertive they fucking start borrowing the lingo just the way that they fucking conducted themselves i could literally watch the in-person transformation because everything's about skin in the game. Everything. Everything is about putting it on the line. Not all on the line, but everything is about putting it on the line. And you have to have blood equity. Fuck sweat equity. You have to, there's bloodletting involved. That's, that's why it's the heroic mission because you are, it's a blood offering. It's a blood offering. And so watching this transformation, watching some of these guys come out of the tunnel, come out of the barrel on the other side and watching them become a man and look these guys some of them were fucking disheveled i've been disheveled but a man is at his very fucking best when he's disheveled this is what i'm telling you about like a man should always be ready to go like a man doesn't have to get ready a man stays ready getting ready is what women do women have to get ready to make an appearance or to go on a date men don't do that men are always ready if I'm in a fucking robe, if I'm in, it doesn't matter what I'm wearing. If I'm wearing a fucking bathing suit and I need to go somewhere, I'm jumping and I'm going. There is no getting ready. It's not, an, it's not a fucking performance for men like that because you are the product. So when you show up on the scene, you're already fucking prepackaged. You are the product. Nothing I'm wearing is the fucking product. I don't need to get ready. I don't need to fucking do my hair. I don't need to fucking comb my mohawk. I don't need to do that shit. My grooming is so fast and fucking leisurely. Get a haircut once a week, boom, leave it alone. That's that. Men don't get ready. You don't have to get ready to go on a date. And if you do, the longer it takes you to get ready for a date, the more you check yourself out in the mirror, the more you fucking shine your shoes, the more you make sure your shirt's ironed, the longer it takes you to get ready for a date is inversely correlated with how well that date's going to go. And I fucking guarantee you that. The faster you get ready and the faster you're there, the better things are going to go because it means you're in flow and it means you were already fucking ready. There's no fucking rehearsal. Men are ready to pounce at all fucking times. Do not forget that. So I'm going to drop these 12 rules to life. I'm also opening the in-person membership is going to be sick. I think we're going to do it in LA and it's going to be very exclusive, tight knit community. But I am going to go really hard on you guys in that one. Really fucking hard. The mentorship, I'm taking on a couple more spots. I sold eight the other day. Um, that's a $20,000 mentorship. DM me. I will go through. I have actually a visual landing page that I can link you that shows you exactly what it offers. But basically, it's till the end of summer. So I'm, you're going to have me in your pocket till the end of summer. And I will field and change your perspective on – we can fucking tackle any fucking question that you have. Nothing is off limits. It's a completely uncensored, immersible experience. So hop in there for that and get ready for these 12 Rules to Life. we got the docuseries dropping soon plus the book. Things are about to get really fucking wild. The book is a tell-all, by the way. Things in that book are going to absolutely blow your mind. Um, of just where my perspective and where my philosophy was molded from stories that you've never heard that are original and original to me. So yeah, we'll talk soon.